Well, good morning. This morning we're going to do worship from home as several of our folks are sick, not doing well, and so we would thought we would just do it, do it virtually today. And So welcome to my home and welcome to our worship at Elon Baptist Church. I thought I'd do a couple songs as we begin and uh, as people are tuning in, so let me go ahead and do Amazing Grace. continue along with our worship and let's do an old good gospel song in the sweet by and by. 
Well, there's a land that is traveling today. I'm here with God. And so the primary objective is to worship God and to help you uh, to worship God as well, those of you who may be watching. And so I'd like to uh, maybe go over some prayer concerns uh, if I could and uh, want to mention several of them. Be in prayer for Barbara Stennett as she has had a fall and not doing as well. Saw her this week. She's still a little bit weak and so we want to be in prayer for her. Continue to be in prayer for Tom Honeycutt. Uh, he is at Fairmont Crossing, I believe, uh, trying to recuperate from all of his uh, injuries that he has had. And so we want to be in prayer for Tom. Be in prayer for his wife, Sue, as well. Uh, pray that she would get the healing that she needs. Be in prayer for Margie Boydo. She had a fall and broke her hip. I think she's at Guggenheimer's. And so I want to be in prayer for her. And I hope that you will be in prayer for her as well. Continue to be in prayer for Darlene Humphreys. Uh, be in prayer for B.J. Cash in a very special way. Uh, his heart is failing him, and he is not doing uh, that great, and he needs a new heart. And so he's going to be having a heart transplant, and so uh, uh, they're just waiting for a heart, an available heart. And so be in prayer for B.J. and Danielle and the boys uh, as they go through that. Also be in prayer for Helen Conley's niece and daughter. They were involved in an accident. They were not in a car, but a car hit them. And uh, so I want to be in prayer for them. I think it's Randy and Jordan are their names. Also be in prayer for Daniel, uh, uh, Daniel, excuse me, Daniel Ashwell. Uh, he's a member at Madison Heights Baptist Church. He's a young boy, uh, all kinds of health difficulty. He has a bad heart and uh, has some infection in his body. And they've, they've really been trying to uh, take care of that infection, and so we want to be in prayer for him, be in prayer for his parents, grandparents, uh, all of those that, that know and love him, uh, want to be in prayer for him. He's very weak, and so we want to lift him up in prayer. Also, a prayer of concern from one of my um, uh, folks at West Lynchburg Baptist Church that's uh, been in the hospital, James Taylor, want to be in prayer for him. want to be in prayer for all of those that are sick, and a reason we're meeting here in my home is because there are a lot of sick people at Elon Baptist Church. We had Vacation Bible School this week, a great Vacation Bible School, but uh, that bug got, got in there and has infected uh, several people, and so we want to be in prayer for all of those that, uh, that are sick, not feeling well. We pray it would be mild, go away just as soon as possible. I know that it's invaded several other churches as well. I know that Grace Point is meeting virtually as we are, 
uh, this morning. And so be in prayer for all of those. So let's lift their hearts up in prayer. Dear God, in the quietness of this moment, being by myself, but really not by myself because you're here. And so, Lord, I pray that you would hear my prayer and our prayers. I pray, dear God, that, uh, that you would just bless all of those that I mentioned. Lord, be with Barbara Stennett and Tom and Sue Honeycutt. Uh, be with B.J. Cash in a very special way. I pray, dear God, that you'd strengthen him and uplift him. I pray, Lord, that you'd be with the others on our prayer list, dear God. And, and there are many others that I did not mention, but, Lord, you know all of the concerns. You know all of the worries. And so, Lord, be with each and every one. Lord, you're the same yesterday, today, and forever. You hear our prayers. You answer our prayers. And so, Lord, we just pray for healing for so many folks. We pray for all of our churches, dear God. And I pray in particular for Elon Baptist Church. I pray, dear God, as they're in their search for a new pastor, that, dear God, that you would uh, just uh, present that person, the perfect person, the person that you've already chosen beforehand, I pray, dear God, that you would just uh, anoint that person and, and that the church would, would meet up with that person and the match would be made and uh, he would have and they would have a wonderful ministry together. But Lord, be with me as I am back at Elon Baptist. Lord, give me the strength and the stamina to do the things that, that need to be done and Lord, that you've called me to do. Uh, Lord, I love Elon Baptist Church and I thank you for the people there. Continue to bless them, I pray. And now, Lord, as I continue in this time of worship, I pray, Lord, that your presence would enter into this place, enter into my house, but also enter into the homes of folks that might be watching this. Lord, just uh, be with them. And may this truly be a worship service. Uh, Lord, this is uh, a time that we can meet with you. So, Lord, be with, be with us all that are watching, all of us that are participating. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. All righty, let me do another song. This song has been on my heart over the last several days. And so uh, let me do that. It's, it's Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have thine own way.
Let us pray together. Dear God, our Heavenly Father, I pray now that You would use me as I open up the pages of Your Word and proclaim Your truth. Help us, dear God, to use Your Word. May it permeate our hearts and our minds and our souls. And as we look at the early church and what they did and how they did it, may we determine that we would get back to the basics, so to speak. And may we be the people that you've called us to be. And may we be the church that you want us to be. Help us to always look to the cross and look to that empty tomb for our strength and our purpose and our calling that we might be the people that you want us to be. And now, Lord, give me clarity of mind and thought and strength of voice to proclaim your truth. I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, again, it seems kind of weird being here in my house by myself, but knowing, hopefully knowing, that there are folks that are watching uh, and, and maybe it would be a blessing to, to those that are watching as we open up the pages uh, this morning. But I'm going to continue this morning, or, or start in some ways, the book of Acts. Uh, we're studying the book of Acts because I think it gives us a map, it gives us an outline for what it means to be the church and what it means to be part of the church. And I think it's important for us to remind ourselves of what the church is supposed to be. Particularly as we as a church are, are searching for that new pastor. So as we begin, or as we continue this journey, ask yourself, what are you called to do? And what are you called to be as part of the church? So as I think about that, I, I think about the journey that, we, that we're about to undertake here in the book of Acts. As I was thinking about that, I was thinking about my childhood and I was thinking about going up to Flat Top and Sharp Top Mountain. I don't know if you've ever been to the top of a mountain before or not. Probably most of us have. But one of the things I always enjoyed doing was I was enjoying getting to the top and then looking behind me at where we came from, where we've been. And then looking at where I am and then looking ahead of me of where I was about to go. Now when I was a boy, I was a member of the RAs at Madison Heights Baptist Church, or the Royal Ambassadors. And for those of us that don't know what that is, or don't remember what that is, that was a boys' organization of the church, of the Baptist churches. It was sort of, it was sort of like the, the Boy Scouts, except it was from a Christian standpoint and a Christian perspective, and particularly a mission emphasis on, on, on how it is that we are to share our faith. But quite often as an RA, we would go camping, or we would go on hikes. And one of the places that, that we would often go in our church is we would sign up and we would go to the state RA camp there at Peaks of Autumn. Now that, that is the camp that several years ago, I think Thomas Road Baptist Church bought or they were given uh, that camp and they've reopened it as another camp for their church but, uh, and for the community. But, but we would go there when it was the state RA camp. And we would always spend a day or two either climbing Flat Top Mountain or Sharp Top Mountain. And on the way up, of course, we were young boys. We would spend all kinds of times playing uh, going up that mountain. And we would look at the trees during the week. We'd learn to identify what various trees were. And so we would stop and we would look at that leaf and we would uh, determine, we would find out exactly what that tree was. And and, but, but, before, but at the bottom, we would always linger around the lake. And we would take some stones and we'd skip them across the lake. On the way up, we would touch the leaves. We would play with the leaves. We would pick up all, all sorts of things. But we would just run and have a big time. And we would run up and down the various trails that were there. We would even run up and down some trails that weren't there. We would make our own trail. We would look at the top and we would say, let's just go straight rather than going uh, in circles and going around this way or that. But uh, we would have a great time. We would try to find wild animals. When we were there, we heard about the otters. After all, it's peaks of otters, so we wanted to see an otter. Or we heard that there might be an elk, and so we wanted to see an elk or a deer or anything. But we boys, we were making so much noise, there was not an animal in sight. If they, if they heard us, they, they ran away very quickly. But we would enjoy 
these camping trips. When we got to the top of the mountain, we would enjoy our time there. We would look down at the lake where earlier we had skipped stones, but we could not believe that now it just looked like a, a very little small puddle of water. We would look at those trails that we had walked up, and now they just looked like little lines going between the trees. We would look at all of the surrounding counties and countryside, and it just looked so beautiful. And then we would look down as to where we were about to leave and see where we were going. After these hikes, we would usually have a picnic at the bottom of the mountain and maybe we would play football or maybe we would uh, uh, play softball, but we would have a good time. And so we were excited as to where we were going. We were excited to be able to go down the mountain to this special treat. And going down the mountain was very different than going up the mountain. The view was different. The exercise was different. You see, going up the mountain, you were constantly pulling yourself up. And going down the mountain, particularly the way that we often went, was straight down. We didn't worry about those trails. We just hit it straight down. But you found yourself having to hold yourself back or you would fall. But going up the mountain was far slower and more deliberate than going down the mountain. Down the mountain was faster, and yet it was also filled with many obstacles, roots and rocks that we had to be careful of. Well, as I studied the book of Acts, and as I look particularly at the, the first book of Acts, we're given kind of a, a similar picture of, of an adventure or an experience that Luke was trying to convey. Now remember, this is Luke's second writing. He had written the account of the life of Jesus in the third gospel, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so now he was trying, as Paul Harvey used to say, he was trying to give the rest of the story. And as we look at the book of Acts, and as we look at the, 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 the Acts of the Apostle, we see where they had been in their relationship with the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. You, but you, all, you will see where they have been, but also you'll see where they are at that particular moment. And then you will also see where they will strive to go in the future. You will begin to see the work of the Holy Spirit in their lives, but also in the life of that early church. And we'll see the theme of fulfillment. We'll see the role and the emergence of the Holy Spirit in the life of individuals and in the life of the church. And you'll see the continuance of the good news of Jesus Christ lived, earned, and proclaimed. And so I'm excited about the book of Acts. I'm excited to be able to preach uh, the book of Acts once again. And I believe that this book will, will speak to us as we try to recapture that power and that excitement and the mission of that New Testament church. So if you have your Bibles, and I hope that you do, turn there with me to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1. I'm going to be reading from the New King James Version, but you can read whatever you have before you. So I hope that you will do that. If not, just listen along. But this is, uh, this is from the book of Acts. And this is what the Word of God says. The former account I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach until the day in which He was taken up after He, through the Holy Spirit, had given commandments to the apostles whom He had chosen, to whom He had presented Himself alive after His suffering by many infallible proofs, being seen by them during forty days and speaking of the things pertaining to the kingdom of God. And being assembled together with them, he commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father, which he said, you have heard from me. For John truly baptized with water, but you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. Therefore, when they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom of Israel? And he said to them, it is not for you to know times or seasons which the Father has put in His own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. Now when He had spoken these things while they watched, He was taken up and a cloud received Him out of their sight. And while they looked steadfastly 
toward the heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood beside them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. May God add his blessings to the reading of his precious word. Well, the book of Acts, just to give a little background, the book of Acts was written by Luke, who was a physician, who was a doctor, and we know that he was also a traveling companion with the Apostle Paul. He wrote this book to a man by the name of Theophilus. And that's a name, isn't it? Of course, this, as Luke's Gospel, it was also kind of an open letter that would be read by other believers and even being read by us today. If we go back to the first chapter of Luke, of his Gospel of Luke, we'll see a little bit of who this Theophilus is and what Luke's aim was in writing not only Luke, but also Acts. In Luke chapter 1, those first four verses, let me read those. Inasmuch as many have taken to, in hand to set in order a narrative of those things which have been fulfilled among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word delivered them to us, it seemed good to me also, having had perfect understanding of all things from the very first, to write you an orderly account, most excellent Theophilus, that you may know the certainty of those things in which you were instructed. Now, we really don't know a great deal about who this Theophilus was, but it seems from the description that he probably was a man of means and, and definitely probably a Christian or at least seeking out answers to Christianity and to Jesus. He was seeking more information about Jesus. We do know by the Scripture what purpose uh, Luke had for writing both the Gospel of Luke and the, uh, the book of Acts of the Apostles. He tells us, that he, it was written after careful investigation, after reading and hearing the, the accounts that were handed down by those who were eyewitnesses to the events of Jesus and his life. And so Luke's task was to write a very orderly account of all of those events so that we may be certain of what actually happened. Now in the first several verses of Acts, Luke again addresses the book to Theophilus, and he, like me and the RAs, uh, begin to look at where he has been and where he is and where he's going. He has finished the first book that looked at the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. He wrote that Jesus rose from the grave and he defeated sin and defeated death not only for himself, but for all who would believe. And so now Luke kind of just wants to rest here for a while and just enjoy the view. And so he looks at the risen Savior. And he sees the Savior who was crucified and is now alive again teaching his disciples. The risen Savior, not a ghost, but the risen Savior. And he says that Jesus gave them many convincing proofs that he was alive. Luke says that Jesus was with them for some period of some 40 days, still teaching them about the kingdom of God. It says that he even ate with the disciples, which shows that his resurrection was not just a spiritual resurrection, but a bodily, a physical resurrection. He defeated death, and you can too, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. It says in the Bible, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. It says, because I live, you shall live also. You see, only Jesus, only Jesus can give you a true and real and everlasting life. And then Luke begins to look down the mountain perhaps at what lies ahead and he begins to record some of those <coughs> promises that Jesus gave his disciples. <coughs> And so he looks at some of those last promises, those parting promises of Jesus, and he begins to, to look at the excitement and the hope and the power that, the, that he was promised to his disciples, to the followers of Jesus Christ and the church. Before Jesus gave the promises, however, he gave a command. 
In verse 4, he says, do not leave Jerusalem. Do not leave Jerusalem, but wait. Wait for the gift that my Father promised. Now, I don't know about you, but I don't like waiting a whole lot, particularly for a gift. Now, at Christmas time or at birthday time, we get a little bit impatient. We get excited. When our children are small, we might catch them trying to figure out what their gift is going to be. They might be trying to look in that box or shake the box or, or try to guess what's in the box, but they want to know and they want to know now. But we're like, God, like that with God many times, aren't we? We want something and we want something bad and we pray for it and we, we are waiting eagerly and impatiently for God to answer. And, and when it seemingly doesn't come or at least we don't think it's come, it upsets us. We want it. And we want it now. Now God's answer might be yes. God's answer might be no. But sometimes that answer is wait. And I believe that many times His answer is wait. And God for many reasons wants us to experience a time before He allows us to have that thing or to have that answer to our prayers. <clears throat> and here <clears throat> in this text we see the disciples waiting. We see the disciples that Jesus was telling them to wait. He may have told them to wait to think a bird or to digest all that He had been telling them over these last 40 days. He may have been telling them to wait in order for them to properly prepare themselves for the next phase of their ministry. He may have been telling them to wait to test their commitment. He may have been telling them to wait to put everything in proper perspective. He may have had them to wait to work through their fears and their doubts. But he had them wait because that is exactly what they needed. And Jesus wanted and instructed them on what they needed to do. Jesus then promised them after they had waited that then they would receive the Holy Spirit. Here Jesus is telling them what, they had, what He had told them before the crucifixion, that they were not to leave, that He would not leave them as orphans, but He would send another, the Holy Spirit. In John's account, in John's account in chapters, verses, chapters 14 through 16, Jesus says that the Holy Spirit would now be our counselor. He would be the Spirit of truth. He would be our teacher, our witness. He would convict the world of our sins. We read all through the Gospels that Jesus was filled with the Spirit and now He tells the disciples that they too would be filled with the Spirit. Jesus told His disciples that they now would be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Now when we think of baptism, oftentimes we think about the physical part of the baptism, being immersed under the water, <clears throat> being immersed and under the water, symbolizing the life and the death and the resurrection of Jesus Christ. But it also symbolizes our life before Jesus, when we were lost in our sins and then we buried our sins, we died to those sins, and then we rose a new creation as the Word of God tells us. And so here, Jesus is talking about that deeper kind of baptism. He is talking about a baptism that is not of the physical body, but is a spiritual baptism, being immersed in the Spirit of God. A baptism with the Holy Spirit which results in a Spirit-filled life of the Christian. Life with power. Life with purpose. Life with a promise. Paul later tells us in 1 Corinthians <clears throat> that each Christian, every Christian, all Christians receive spiritual gifts. Each Christian <clears throat> has spiritual gifts. And they're all for the common good of the body of Christ which is the church. Now Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 4, uh, 4 through 11, he says there are diversities of gifts but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries but the same Lord. There are diversities of activities but it is the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For to one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another, the word of knowledge through the same Spirit. 
to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same Spirit, to another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works in all things, distributing to each one individually as He wills. Let me ask a question. Do you know what your spiritual gift is? Because you do have one. And part of our task in life, after we become a Christian in particular, part of our task is to discover what those gifts or gifts is and, and to develop it for use in the kingdom of God or, or for use in the church. Paul then tells the, uh, us in Galatians in the fifth chapter that there are also not just gifts of the Spirit, but also fruits of the Spirit. Just like a productive fruit tree will produce fruit, we are to be led by the Spirit of God, and we will produce fruits. And he tells us what those fruits are. In Galatians chapter 5, verses 22 through 25, it says, But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, long-suffering, Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control, against, against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. This is what Jesus was promising the disciples. And He also promises to each one of us who believe. And part of our task, again, is to identify our spiritual gifts and to produce fruit in keeping with our faith. We should begin to look more and more like Jesus. We used to sing the song, and I thought it was interesting this morning when I got up, I was watching West Lynchburg Baptist Church's uh, worship service. And one of the songs they sang was, Let others see Jesus in you. Let others see Jesus in you. And, and they should see a little bit of Jesus in each one of us. And that should be one of our prayers, that others would see a little bit of Jesus at least in us. And, and may we point our lives, may they look at our lives, and may they point others to Jesus. Jesus then gives them another promise. After they receive the Holy Spirit, then it says they will be witnesses throughout the world. They will be equipped. They will be commissioned. They will be empowered by the Holy Spirit to be God's representatives on this earth. And what an awesome privilege it is, as Paul says, to be ambassadors for Christ. I was speaking of the RAs, and that was our motto. We are ambassadors for Christ. And with this promise, Luke makes his outline for the entire book of Acts. He says that we are to be witnesses in Jerusalem. And we see that in chapters 1 through 7. He says that they would be witnesses in all of Judea and Samaria, which is in chapters 8 and 9 of the book of Acts. That they would be witnesses to the very ends of the earth. And this would include Caesarea and Antioch and Asia Minor and Greece and Rome, which Paul writes about, which Luke writes about in chapters 10 through 28 of Acts. And of course, this goes on even further. This command, this privilege, this calling extends to us. It is the driving force behind the Southern Baptist Convention's cooperative program which allows us to support missions at home as well as all around the world. It is the driving force behind our Annie Armstrong Easter offering which sends missionaries all across North America. It is the driving force behind the, the Lottie Moon Christmas offering which sends missionaries literally all around the world. It is also the driving force that allows us to have partnerships all around Virginia and in Virginia and through Virginia. It is the driving force that compels our church to reach out to our neighborhoods and beyond. We are able to do all of these things in and through and by the power of the Holy Spirit. 
It's interesting to note that the word witness not only means testimony, but it also has tied in with it the connotation that we use for the word martyr. And it was a bit of a prophecy when Jesus said that they would be witnesses. Because He also had in mind that they also would be martyrs because we know that all but John was put to death for his, for, for his belief and testimony. But they knew and you can know that death is not the end for a child of God. Jesus proved it on the cross. And He proved it as He rose from the grave in that tomb that is empty. And you can know beyond a shadow of a doubt that you will live eternally because Jesus proved it. And He promised it. And then He promised that He would come again one day. Look at verses 10 and 11 again. And while they looked steadfastly toward heaven as he went up, behold, two men stood by them in white apparel who also said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw him go into heaven. John 14 verses 1 through 4 says, Let not your heart be troubled, you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's heard so many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And where I go, you know, and the way you know. And as we continue on, Thomas, doubting Thomas. Thomas said to him, Lord... We do not, do not know where you're going and how can we know the way? And Jesus said to him, and Jesus says to you, Jesus says to us all, I am the way and the truth and the life and no one comes to the Father except through me. Through the years, I have visited many church members and community members that they're Physical uh, abilities prevented them from being able to physically go to church. But they are a huge part of our church and many churches and, and, and a huge part of our community. They served faithfully for so many years. I had this one particular woman that <clears throat> I would go visit her just about weekly. And I remember every time that I went, she quoted me the scripture passage I just read from John 14, 1 through 6. And he, she would quote that to me every visit. And she said that that passage was her favorite passage. And it was her favorite passage because it was her favorite promise. A wonderful promise. And she was holding on to that promise. What a wonderful promise of hope and deliverance of salvation. She told me that she looks forward to that day when that promise too will be fulfilled and she will be able to be reunited with her husband and friends. And will all, they will all be united and be able to praise God who gives us salvation through Jesus Christ. Jesus was promised long ago by the prophets. And many didn't believe. But Jesus came just as He promised. And yet still, many people don't believe. He came. He lived. He was crucified for our sins. And yet He rose from the grave on the third day to defeat sin and death for us all. And yet, still many people don't believe. You know, He told us He's coming again. And this will be the second advent. We're told in Acts how He will return. Verse 11 again, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into the heavens? This same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you saw Him go into heaven. John, again, was the only disciple who did not die a martyr's death. 
John who was spared for a special message, a special revelation from God, wrote these words of that special revelation in the book of the Bible that we call the Revelation. And it says this, Behold, He is coming with clouds, and every eye will see Him, even those who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him, even so. Amen. Jesus' parting promise. And His parting promises include you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. They were and we are. You will be my witnesses. They were and we are. And this same Jesus who was taken from you into heaven will come back in the same way you have seen Him go in to heaven. And He will fulfill that promise as well. The question is, are you ready? Let's pray. <clears throat> Dear God, our Heavenly Father, <clears throat> I thank You for Your Word. I thank You for the book of Acts and the tremendous messages that are contained in that precious book. There are so many promises that you have given. Many you have already fulfilled, but many yet to be fulfilled, but they will be. And one is that Jesus is coming again. And so now, even in, the, in, even in our own homes, help us to be willing to make that decision to accept Jesus. And those of us who have already accepted, may we make the decision to follow Jesus more faithfully and more fully. It is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. This morning, <clears throat> right where you are in your own home, you can make a decision. As I've said, uh, through the coronavirus, through the COVID, that invitation time has been a little bit awkward in our churches because you're not real sure whether to make that invitation to ask them to come and pray with you. But I've often told them you can make that decision anywhere you are. You can come forward and I'd be glad to pray with them. Uh, or they can stay in their seats. We can stay in our seats. We can make that decision there. So this morning, you can make that decision right in your home, right in the comfort of your own home. I want you to know this morning that Jesus loves me. That's one of the things we taught in our vacation Bible school children this week. Jesus loves me. This I know, for the Bible tells me so. We told them that Jesus loved them enough to, to die for them so that they could live forever. And so this invitation is for, not just for children, it's for all of us. If you've never accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, I want you to know that, that you're a sinner. I'm a sinner. We're all sinners. The Bible says, for we all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. But it also says, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. So Jesus came and lived a perfect life, a sinless life, and so he was able to die for our sins, for the sins of the world. So if you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, I invite you to do it this morning and just say to Jesus, I'm a sinner and I need a Savior. I'm willing to turn from my sins, to repent of my sins, and to accept you as my Lord and Savior and be willing to follow you. To be willing to receive the gifts that you have in store for me to build up the church and to, to be used in the kingdom of God. I'm willing to be, to be used as a witness to others that they too might know the joy of salvation. So if you've never given your life to Christ, do that this morning. <clears throat> if you're already a Christian, maybe you need to rededicate your life this morning. You can do that as well. To say, I want to live for Jesus more faithfully every day. And so you can do that as well. So this morning, uh, would you do that? Would you give your life to Jesus Christ? I'm just going to sing a, a verse or two of this song and then we'll close... Uh, this morning, and I hope it's been a blessing to you, not being able to be in church, but being able to be church. If God has spoken, you go ahead and make that decision. This is my prayer on bended knee. Thank you for loving Someone like me, thank you for sending your only son as 
God, use each and every one of us and bless us as we go about serving you each and every day. This is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen.